and welcome to eBody Lodge. This is episode one of what I hope to be many episodes in documenting the build and restoration of a 1970 Dodge Challenger RT U-Code. Uh, it's a 440 Magnum, of course. It's an automatic car. And we found this thing back in 2018 uh, near Cleveland. Uh, loaded up the trailer after several conversations with the owner. It was a project car, completely taken apart. And after talking with the guy and being reasonably assured that the car was what I thought it was, we loaded up the trailer and took off on a 500 mile trek on one of the hottest days of summer. And it was right around 100 degrees in Cleveland and the uh, humidity was off the scale. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a uh, slideshow, if you will, on this car or on the day that we picked it up. It'll put forth a little bit of history. It's going to show you pretty much all the parts and everything that uh, we found when we got there. And four, almost five years into this project, I have zero regrets. I feel like the previous owner was as honest as he could be about the car and I haven't found very many surprises, which is a good thing. Um, please remember to like and subscribe and uh, click on the notifications. Um, being new at this, I'm not the best YouTuber out there, so I need all the help I can get to uh, help grow this channel and help other people. So I'll take you through a little slideshow here of uh, the cars that uh, spell out my history with the E-bodies as I've had nine or ten of them. In 1979, I bought this little gold six-cylinder 1970. Uh, it had about 47,000 miles on it. No air conditioning, no power brakes, no power steering, but it was the car of my dreams and I had a couple of really fun summers in that car and ended up selling it. And in 1980, I happened across this 71 318 three speed in bright green. Uh, it would have had white uh, stripes on the sides and white top, white interior. It was just the car that my dreams were of. And as you can see by the picture, it was an unfortunate victim of some stupidity at a high rate of speed car went nose over tail uh, at over 105 miles per hour. Uh, lucky not to be a fatality in that. Um, but a great car, gone because of stupidity. So then I turned around and I bought another 1971 318. Uh, dark blue, white top, uh, M44 trim across the front end, which is an incredible value these days. I probably sold the car for less than what that trim would be worth nowadays. And again, drove it for a couple years, had a great amount of fun in it. It was an automatic on the column. And I think I let it go for something like $1,200, but we didn't know then. I wound up then buying another 1971 hardtop. Um, and it was the gold, uh, I should know, I should say light tan metallic. Uh, the car was perfect and I just let it go. Probably for parts if I remember right. Uh, another 318 automatic on the floor. Uh, what that car would be worth right now just in the parts alone I don't even want to think about. Then in 1982 I happened to cross uh, just by chance a 1970 Dodge Challenger 440 uh, JS23 UOB car. Uh, the door sticker said that it was made in May of 1970. So the last part of the VIN probably begins in a three. Um, I am looking for that car. I would love to find that car again. When I sold it, I, I had bought it at 28,000 miles. And when I sold it, it had about 33,000 on it. It was always well cared for and kept garaged. I knew it'd be worth something someday. A seeker found me 
bought the car and was headed for Vermont, if that helps. Who knows where it wound up, but I would love to find that car. There's a reward involved in that. Uh, moving on, I, I found this JS23 ROB um, in burnt orange, and it was missing the engine and transmission. The guy sold me this car for two or $300, and it had pretty much everything there except the engine and transmission. Had I only known, I did not get a picture of the fender tag. I did not look for a build sheet. Um, we just didn't know back then. I mean, these cars were laying everywhere. Um, that car is currently uh, nearing completion with the person that I sold it to. He found a Hemi to put in it, and hopefully he will allow me to make another uh, YouTube video on that in the near future. And then in 1987, I found this yellow convertible, a JS27NOB. Uh, the engine and transmission were missing. It wound up with a 440 and a four speed. Uh, it was just a fun, short heart throb, and I sold that car off as well. And in, tw in 2016, I bought a 73 Barracuda, uh, was in the process of restoring it, got the whole body put together, and it wound up going to um, Iowa and I did that because I needed to make room for this car that I'm doing this show about right now. And that's this amazing uh, JS23 UOB automatic on the floor. And you will see by some of the pictures in the slideshow from our trip to Ohio. Um, it was blazing hot that day. I can't say it enough. Um, it was a long trip each direction. Um, we drove straight through coming back home with a grossly overloaded trailer and a grossly overloaded half ton Dodge Ram. It was just by happenstance that we made it back without anything serious happening. Uh, the car is amazing. I love the car. I love the project. It's been a real joy. And as you can see by the pictures, there was a huge amount of parts. There was extra hoods thrown in, including shaker hoods and uh, numerous items that uh, were original to the car. Uh, you can see that it's a numbers matching engine, numbers matching transmission. Um, the only thing that was missing uh, was the original 323 rear gear. I went to Dr. Diff and picked up one in the same gear ratio from him. And moving right along, the engine, transmission, and rear end are completely done, ready to drop in the car. And I'm moving forward on the project as we speak. I hope to have it in paint um, this fall. And we'll just see where that takes us. Fortunately, the car came with a very well preserved fender tag. And I'll go through some of the numbers here. Many people know these, but some don't. So hopefully this helps you out. The N85 is for the tachometer. The R11 is for a two watt AM radio. The V5F is for the green body side moldings, which were very hard to come by. The Y05 means it was built for US order. The EN2 is just a stamping for the end of sales code. The C55 stands for the bucket seats. The C62 uh, brings upon us the driver's side six-way bucket. Uh, nice little ad. Uh, the G33 is the driver's side chrome mirror, and that's driver's side only. M21 is the chrome drip rail moldings. N41 is the dual exhaust. The N42 is the bright exhaust tips, which add a nice touch to the RT dual exhaust systems. The V1F is the vinyl top in green. Had to hunt around for a while to get that ordered properly with the right size seam. Um, A01 is the light package. A04 is the basic options group. A62 is the rally instrument cluster. 
The B51 is for the power brakes, which this car also has front disc from the factory. The EF8 is a paint code for the dark green metallic. The H5F8 is the high trim grade cloth inserts in the vinyl seats, also in green. The B04 is November 4th, 1969, scheduled production date, which these cars may or may not be made on that actual day. The 00280 is the vehicle order number. And I was told by a member of the ebodies.org site who is very good at these statistics that it's one of the earliest recorded cars on the number two assembly line. It was interesting to find out. The E86, of course, is the 375 horsepower 444 barrel engine option. The D32 is the three-speed automatic 727 torque flight. And of course, the remainder is the serial number of the car. Upon arrival, we found a very well-preserved sarcophagus, as I refer to it. The firewall was very solid. Uh, no, that's not oil pouring out of the firewall. That is a rust proofing agent that the previous owner had put in it years prior, which was appreciated. The fenders were in impeccable condition, no rust holes in them, already in an epoxy. The headliner was in great shape, but I did remove it to replace it with one that was new. Um, my preference, and I didn't want to take 50 years of cigarette smoke, whatever smoke, and bring it on into this new car. The interior had several of the parts stored inside of it. The quarter panels had been patched, looked like in the late 70s, early 80s, and they were to be replaced with AMD quarter panels. The original 440 air cleaner assembly, driver's door in great condition. Quite a bit of parts stacked around. This car had been sitting for a long time. Driver's side quarter panel, same story as the other side to be replaced with an AMD panel because it had been patched in the late 70s, early 80s. Original rims, all date coded correctly. Tail panel was in outstanding condition. Serial numbers matched up on the engine and it did not appear to have been tampered with. Transmission the same. Code 115 written in marker on the valve cover, which may have been done later but that's a nice touch that will be added back to the engine. The door decal depicting the November 1969 build. Engine stampings on the boss on the top of the 440. All checked out to be correct with the F code for 1970 engine and the HP stamping. Another shot of the serial number on the engine. The May of 14, 1969 casting date on the engine block. Then of course the trailer on the way out there, all prepped and ready to go. Triple padlock so it didn't get stolen at the hotel the night before. All the parts were hauled outside in the heat and the sun with a little bit of shade there to inventory everything before loading. The hood was in very nice condition. The F8 green center console, also in very nice condition. Extra hoods that were tossed in on the deal. Another angle of all the parts. Floor pan was very solid with the original paint still in it. Radiator support with the correct stamping. 
cowl with the correct stamping. A couple of really fun kids and great helpers trying out some of the interior. The underbelly of this car you could have eaten off of. It was so clean. The interior was 95% perfect, minus the little split that you see in the driver's seat there where the cloth meets the vinyl. Engine and transmission were bolted together. The loading process begins. The car was sitting on its axle with a universal roller under the front cross member. Aftermarket shaker bubble and a grossly overloaded truck and trailer. And we were on our way back home. This time we're driving straight through. I was not going to leave this load of parts sitting in the parking lot of a Motel 6. Finally made it home to the shop. The E-Body Lodge had a welcome guest. The unloading process was much more fun than the loading process. My beloved shop dog that I just lost a few weeks ago has left a huge void. There we are sitting next to the 73 Barracuda that I wound up selling to a new home in Iowa, making room for this project. The S83 code for the rim blow steering wheel, more of the numbers from the transmission, little angle view of the shop, and there she sits, ready for the journey. So with that, we conclude the basic introduction of this project car. I thank you for taking the time to watch this. I would ask that you please like and subscribe and click the notifications. Helps me out a little bit with uh, getting this built. Please share this with friends, anybody interested in the e-bodies or anybody in the Mopars or even anybody in the car restoration hobby. I'm here to share. I'm here to take your suggestions, to learn from you, as well as to share with others who need to do some learning as well. There will be many more of these episodes. I apologize for not having much video for the introductory phase of this channel, but there was just a bunch of still photos and this is the best I could do for now. It's a learning process. Bear with me and I hope you'll stick around with the E-Bodies Lodge. Thank you. Just a little bit of a mention here and a shout out to a fantastic group of people on the ebodies.org forum website, if you will. That's e-bodies.org. Great people, very helpful. I couldn't be doing this stuff if it wasn't for them. For the build sheet and fender tag decoders, they are on that ebodies.org website, a lot of work has gone into that by the good people that built the site. Any questions you have, you reach out to these people and they will help you.